Welcome. My name is Jatra Stewart. I'm the Senior Associate Director for the UVA Club's Global Network and a proud alum of the Class of 2018. UVA Club's Global Network is a collection of UVA communities designed to bring UVA from Charlottesville to you through a variety of events. Tonight, I'd like to welcome you to Through the Lens. Through the Lens is a series designed to highlight current UVA faculty across grounds to share their expertise through their lens to our alumni, parents, and friends around the world. We have an incredible faculty speaker for you all tonight. Let me begin by mentioning that this session is being recorded and will be sent out to all registrants. Please note that this event is in webinar format. So participants, cameras and phones are disabled. If you have questions throughout today's discussion, type them in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Closed captioning is also available at the bottom of your screen. Now allow me to introduce our moderator for this evening, Dr. Michelle Igbani. Michelle is a graduate of the UVA College of Arts and Sciences in 2003. She is currently a practicing physician in Baltimore, Maryland, and she proudly serves and has served as the club president for the UVA Club of Baltimore for the last two years. Thank you, Michelle, for being here tonight and pass it over to you. Thank you, Joshua. I appreciate the introduction. Hi, everyone. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, it's been such a pleasure to start these series off and we'll love to start with introducing our first uh, speaker. I've had the honor to get to know Professor Ashley Greenwade. She is an assistant professor of media studies and African-American studies at the University of Virginia. Broadly speaking, her work transverses the fields of Black girlhood studies, digital and visual media studies, and Black feminist theories, and digital humanities. Professor Wade has a PhD in women's and gender studies from Rutgers University and is an alumna of the Carter G. Woodson Institute for African-American and African Studies Fellowship Program. Her work on Black cultural production appears in the following, Cultural Studies, The Black Scholar, Camera Obscura, Feminism, Culture and Media Studies, Visual Arts Research, Women, Gender and Families of Color, and the National Political Science Review. Professor Wade's debut monograph, Black Girl Autopoetics, Angry and Possibility in Everyday Digital Practice, is available through the Duke University Press. She explores the role of Black girls' digital practices in documenting and preserving everyday Black life. You can order your copy today at the Duke University Press and use code E24AWADE, that's E24AWADE, -E, for a 30% discount. Quick fact, Professor Wade is originally from North Carolina, so I have to share with you, she is a Blue Devils fan. <laughs> However, through her previous engagement with um, as doing a fellow through the Carter G. Woodson Institute and now her coming back to the university as an assistant professor, I believe we have convinced her to be a, a total Wahoo fan. Now I'm gonna pass it on to Professor Wade. Please welcome her. Thank you so much, Dr. Igbani, for that wonderful introduction. Go who's go. Um, thank you all for being here, um, and I just really am excited to talk with you about my new book, Black Girl Auto Poetics, Agency in Everyday Digital Practice. And as um, Dr. Igbani mentioned, it is out through Duke University Press. Um, I'm sorry, I'm trying to pull up my, uh, share my screen with you all. Um, it's available through Duke University Press. And um, if you use the discount code or if you order through Duke University Press and use the discount code, um, you can get 30% off. Um, so tonight I'm gonna be talking to you about uh, documenting black girls, documenting black life through looking at black girls' digital practices. And before I talk about the book, I always like to begin with a discussion of how I started doing this research in the first place. So my first job out of undergrad was as a high school English teacher at the school that I attended for ninth and 10th grades. 
And like a lot of first year teachers, I was underprepared, especially because I had not originally intended to pursue a career in K through 12 education. But I had zeal and that's what matters, right? Wrong. <laughs> that school year was one of the most challenging periods of my life. And I feel like that job remains the hardest one that I ever had. When it was time to renew contracts in February, I resigned with no solid plan for what I would do next. But I knew that I would not be teaching high school ever again until I did. After finishing my master's degree, I ended up getting another job teaching. But this job was different from the first one. It was an independent all girls school and it was in a different city and a different state. My first classroom at this school was in the basement of the school's main building. There were windows, but they only looked out to the concrete structures of the first floor. To say that I did not like the location of my classroom would be an understatement, but it became a somewhat sacred space for the students who frequented it. In that first year, I had three black students, all in the same section of ninth grade English. One of them ended up becoming my advisee, and the other two visited my classroom enough that I acted as an unofficial advisor and school mom for them as well. They came to my classroom at least once a day outside of instructional time, and when they continued this and they continued this visitation long after they moved on from ninth grade. While I expected to have and maintain connections with students in my classes. I began to notice that Black girls I didn't even teach would come visit me in my classroom at least a few times a week and sometimes multiple times in one day. I should note that girls of diverse racial and ethnic backgrounds frequented my basement classroom. I taught ninth grade, which is a critical period of transition, and many students found my laid back nurturing approach comforting. But the Black girls' visits were specific to their experiences as Black girls, their reasons for needing to be comforted or consoled or calmed down were different from their non-Black peers. Not only were their motivations for visiting me different from the other girls, but they had a specific manner of visiting. For instance, the Black girls almost always closed the door when they came in to talk to me especially if they wanted to talk about something unrelated to class or school. Another difference is that they would almost always visit in pairs or groups, and they kept their voices low oftentimes, which led me to think of my classroom as a kind of hush harbor for the school's Black girls. My classroom became a place where Black girls would come hang out with me. Sometimes we talked about their frustrations, Sometimes we talked about the latest music or watched funny YouTube videos, danced and laughed at memes. All of these interactions helped me cultivate a bond between the girls and me. But their fascination with Snapchat, which launched the year that I started working at this school, really drove me to develop a deeper understanding of their lives because this app came to dominate their conversations or our conversations, but the girls would never let me see anything that they were posting. So they would always talk about what was going on on Snapchat, but they would never actually like show me anything on the app. And so when I thought about this kind of open secrecy um, that they maintain um, alongside the way that they hid what was you know going on, on Snapchat, it made me wonder about the role of social media applications in general to offer ways for Black girls to have spaces where they could simply be without the pressure to placate others' anxieties or misunderstandings of who they are. So years of studying and collaborating with Black girls birthed Black Girl Autopoetics Agency in Everyday Digital Practice. The book focuses on high school and middle school age Black girls in the United States, and it uses ethnography and media, ana media analysis to offer an account of Black girls' everyday digital practices, 
what their digital content reveals about their everyday experiences and how their digital productions contribute to a broader record of Black life. Throughout the book, I weave together a series of stories of how Black girls create spaces and discourse through their social media content. I present these stories as a provocation to reevaluate processes that are integral to Black life, such as space making, archiving, communicating, and organizing through the lens of Black girlhood. In doing this, I argue that Black girls' digital practices comprise the means through which they invent and reinvent themselves and in turn invent and reinvent what it means to live, create, and preserve Black life. Before I get into a few specific examples of how Black girls tell their stories through their social media content, I want to spend a little bit of time defining the term Black girl autopoetics. So I describe Black girl autopoetics as a means of creation or a creative praxis. In breaking down autopoesis to its roots, the word translates to self-making. I use the concept of self-making in two ways. Black girls making themselves, that is making their subjectivities or their identities. And then Black girls taking claim to a creative process that is their own or making for themselves. I define Black girl autopoetics as a praxis of creation because it encompasses how Black girls invent and reinvent cultural products, spaces, and discourses in their subjective formation and expression. As a tool of creation and preservation, Black girl autopoetics empowers Black girls to construct narratives of their everyday experiences. Their digital content, especially on social media platforms, often functions as evidence of their social interactions and it's also a way for Black girls to show their lives. So with this preface, today's talk is going to focus on the second chapter of my book, which shows how Black girls use social media to document their lives and what they value in processes of recording and telling their stories. I'll explain how Black girls' digital practices allow them to construct informal archives that not only provide glimpses into everyday Black girlhood, but are also essential to the fight against Black erasure as they preserve Black girls' images, stories, and memories. Vernacular image making, especially photography, has been a significant archival method for Black people as it has become an essential component of documentation and storytelling practices. For Black Americans, photographs reflect both the need to preserve records of Black life against a history of erasure and engage in processes of self-making. Some of the main examples of Black vernacular photography like studio portraits, school pictures, amateur photos of events like birthday parties and graduation hold significance beyond capturing the milestones of individual people and families. These vernacular images oftentimes compiled into photo albums or adorning the walls of Black American households function as personal or unofficial informal archives of a family's history. For example, the images you see here are pictures from my family's informal archive. The house in the background provides the backdrop for lots of my family's pictures because the purchase of that house is an important part of our family's history. The picture in the middle is actually a photo um, from one of my um, analog photo albums um, and it features me on my 17th birthday. And then the picture on the far right is a picture of my cousins and me. Collecting and displaying vernacular images and photo albums and within our homes 
maintain their relevance within Black American cultures, but technological advancements have meant shifts in both everyday documentation and sharing practices. For instance, the invention of mass production, the invention and mass production of video cameras meant that people could capture an event in real time in addition to having photographs as a trace of the event. The digital age, especially with the popularity of social media, has allowed, encouraged, and compelled wider sharing of these vernacular images. So the image that's on the far right with my cousins and me, for example, actually has a Snapchat filter because it was taken for the purposes of sharing on social media. In the United States, smartphone, smartphones are ubiquitous and relatively inexpensive as a whole, which means that every smartphone owner has a camera at their disposal that can capture both still and moving images. Not only do smartphone users have constant access to a camera, but image-driven social media applications make the process of uploading pictures and videos very easy. With such tools at the ready, creating and sharing vernacular imagery is not only easier than it was in the pre-digital era, but it's also become an, an integral part of socializing for many people. While we can look at Black girls' social media accounts as their own personal archives, certain motifs appeared within Black girls' posts that might point to more collective archives of everyday Black girlhood. So I'm going to describe some of some motifs that I found in my research. And these are things that appeared across demographic factors like age, social class, and geographic location. So just a quick note about the images that I'm going to share. Um, in doing the research for this book, I collected literally thousands of images from Instagram accounts marked as public, as well as screenshots from YouTube accounts. However, I don't reproduce the original screenshots um, or the original images that I um, took from Instagram um, in the book or in presentations of the book. Instead, I use illustrations that capture the overall content of the original images. The illustrations were created by my good friend, Al Valentin, who received their PhD from Rutgers as well. We were in the same cohort. Al does work in digital media, gaming, and race. And I knew they would take care to remake the images in ways that don't make Black girls seem like caricatures. I made the decision to use illustrations instead of original screenshots for several reasons. First, even though teenagers post images to social media accounts that are set to public, they might not want their photos and videos floating around outside of social media in public ways. Relatedly, using illustrations instead of the original photos and videos accounts for when girls turn their accounts from public to private and when they delete certain images. I don't want to circulate photos or videos that girls have taken off the internet for whatever reason. And finally, I do this to protect my research participants' identities. Not all people will look at these images of Black girls and understand the arguments that I'm making about their creativity and their autonomy. I don't want to make them targets for people who might wish them harm. So the illustrations have enough differences in facial and bodily likenesses to protect the original user's confidentiality. And it's not as easy to do a reverse image lookup from an illustration as it would be if I used a screenshot. So I don't have enough time to talk about all of the motifs that I discuss in the book. So I wanna talk about how Black girls document two coming of age special occasions, prom and graduation. Among the Black girls I followed on social media, prom pictures played a central role in their overall collections of images. And many of the images have similarity in style across years and geographic location. 
So take Cherie, for example. In her individual prom picture, she sits in a chair underneath a gold wall decoration that matches her gold dress. She crosses her legs, which slightly reveals her high heel shoes and fresh pedicure. And her dark brown skin shines as she places one hand in her lap with the other one cupped under her chin. Her look is serious and majestic. Cherie's prom image aligns with a genre of Black girls' prom pictures in which they pose alone. In these images, the girls pose with serious looks on their faces, careful to attract attention to flawless makeup and color palettes that coordinate with their dresses. When the pandemic hit the United States right before prom season of 2020, Black girls got even more creative with this traditional prom pose. And one of the most captivating and resonant examples of this persistence in redefining the prom selfie came from a girl on Instagram named Robin. And in a series of images, Robin poses in an elegant baby blue gown with a matching rhinestone adorned mask. The caption reads, quarantine queen, prom, hashtag prom 2020. Robin's prom images exemplify how Black girls and Black people in general use setbacks and hardships as fuel for reinvention. In this case, instead of letting prom cancellations interfere with the milestone of prom, Robin upgraded the conventions of prom imagery to reflect the specific moment. And this type of context capturing comprises one of the primary goals of vernacular image making. Another main goal of vernacular image making is to expand the story of the visual subject's humanity. Black girls' prom images do this work in two primary ways. First, Black girls' prom selfies show how Black girls can be fancy and feminine. While it's important not to impose femininity onto Black girls, the feminine presentations within the images that I describe here offer a potentially subversive contrast to how white supremacy excludes Black girls and Black women from the concept of femininity altogether, a conceptual foreclosure that has material consequences for how people treat Black girls. Certainly, not all Black girls desire to be feminine, but for those who do, their embodiment in these prom selfies contributes to a portrayal of Black girlhood that contradicts the relegation of Black girls to an inherently unfeminine category. Not only do Black girls' prom images show that they can be formal or dainty, but they also show how Black girls have their own definitions of what feminine elegance looks like. So slicking down baby hairs, picking out Afro puffs and posing on certain types of furniture, like that old school wicker chair that you see in a lot of Black people's images, um, all reflect Black girl beauty standards and aesthetics. A second way that Black girls' prom images compel us to see their humanity is through displays of whimsy. Black girls' propensity for whimsy is often drowned out by early adultification and disproportionate criminalization. In prom images, we see Black girls' playful side especially in their images with friends and their behind the scenes get ready with me videos. Black girls get caught up in the fairy tale like connotation of prom, just like other teenagers. But people often associate the whimsical elements of black girls playing with makeup and dressing up in fancy clothes as them being grown or adult-like. Even though the prom pictures I encountered during my research represent or feature feminine presenting Black girls. This whimsy also applies to masculine presenting Black girls and non-binary teens. And in some ways, the idea of whimsy is even more significant when we talk about masculine Black girls because it demonstrates a form of masculinity that is not toxic. Ultimately, Black girls' prom images encapsulate and the reinventive qualities of Black girl autopoetics 
through displays of their creativity and through reorienting us to their humanity. Another special occasion that Black girls documented frequently in their social media archives is graduation. High school graduation is an important milestone in United States culture as a whole, serving as an unofficial rite of passage from childhood to adulthood. For Black Americans, the importance of high school graduation cannot be separated from historical and ongoing struggles for educational equity. While the United States has seen legislative and social gains in the realm of public primary and secondary education, underfunding of predominantly black schools and forces like the school to prison pipeline demonstrate the persistent obstacles black Americans face in the pursuit of education. Therefore, as much as high school graduation is part of the broader fabric, the broader cultural fabric of the United States, its significance holds even more weight for Black Americans, or to put it another way, it hits different. Graduation images oftentimes fall under the larger umbrella of selfies, but within Black girls' social media posts and the Black vernacular image-making tradition, they truly comprise their own genre. Graduation photos have a specific grammar, especially in terms of staging. Along with these visual conventions, the graduation, the grammar of graduation images posted on social media also governs discursive requirements around captioning and the way that these captions are used to document this important milestone. For example, some of the girls who graduated with academic honors have very specific features in their pictures. As a way of visually representing their academic achievements, these girls create regal affects by elongating their bodies, donning parts of their regalia, and wearing semi-formal dresses, which are oftentimes white. Now, within Black American culture, the connotation of white dresses and white clothing, while sometimes, you know, um, imbricated with respectability politics, oftentimes extends beyond a generic conflation of whiteness and purity. There's a sharpness and a triumphant quality assigned to white clothing for celebratory occasions. In the two images you see here, Dee Dee on the left and Monet, not only follow this unspoken protocol for staging achievement, but they also use the captions to corroborate the visual message. Dee Dee writes, quote, she finished the race and she placed first, 4.4 GPA, hashtag valedictorian, end quote. The staging of Dee Dee's image combined with this particular caption show how she distinguished herself by not only finishing high school, but earning the title of valedictorian. Monet also signals to her accomplishments, captioning her image, quote, Freshman year, I said I wanted my neck to be broke, and I did exactly that, not literally, of course, end quote. Monet's metaphorical broken neck refers to a desire to have so many honors that her neck would feel heavy from carrying multiple honor cords, a National Honor Society sash, and medals. Both of these girls use the grammar of graduation photos, specifically that of high achievement, to stage their triumphant images. Another mood of graduation grammar still focuses on achievement, but this sense of accomplishment is one earned against all odds. Nomi's photo series of her graduation day includes an image of her squatting next to a car that has a poster taped to the back that reads, Black Graduates Matter. The image speaks for itself, but Nomi's caption also highlights the photo's significance. Quote, as the world spirals in chaos, I thank God for another day. We did it. And it is now our time to become the leaders of the future. Stay safe. Fear is not a factor for us. Hashtag one love, hashtag black lives matter, hashtag class of 2020, end quote. 
Judging by the year of Nomi's graduation, the chaos to which she refers reflects a tumultuous socio-political climate. The onset of the COVID-19 global pandemic resulted in unprecedented changes in everyday activities, such as stay-at-home orders, widespread school closings, transitioning to virtual workspaces, mass furloughs, increased unemployment, and business closings. The devastation of the pandemic, coupled with an ineffective national response, exacerbated ongoing issues like climate change and police brutality against communities of color and poor people. Given the heightened collective sense of anxiety in 2020, Nomi's image and caption intensify the sense of resilience and hope reflected in Black graduation images because her class still completed high school in spite of challenges well beyond their control. Both the accomplished student and the against all odds style of graduation images fit into a broader narrative of this genre, which centers reaching one's dreams. This visual graduation grammar exemplifies Black girl autopoetics because it remixes traditional Black vernacular image conventions of graduation for a digital context. Black girls' graduation images maintain the regal celebratory style of traditional Black graduation photos, but they also become part of a public archive that documents Black girls' achievements along with their refusal to be broken and or erased by institutional misogyny war. Through analysis of Black girls' everyday images, we come to see how they use social media as a means of self-curation, a process that simultaneously involves thoughtful selection of images to share on social media and creates a sense of authority for Black girls regarding their images. Black girls' self-curation allows them to engage in self-fashioning or self-definition. Like many other aspects of Black girls' digital practices, their self-curation connects to a history of Black people striving to define themselves within and against white supremacist sociocultural contexts that render Blackness inhuman. For example, Black historical figures like Sojourner Truth and W.E.B. Du Bois understood how photography, particularly the self-portrait, could be used to envision Black humanity. These examples demonstrate a tradition of how Black people have utilized visuality as a means of self-definition and Black girls' self-curation in digital spaces fits within this history of Black people deploying their own images to represent their lives in ways that better reflect their experiences. Not only does Black girl self-creation give them a sense of authority on a personal level, but it also speaks to a larger conversation about authenticity because the possibility of performativity within Black girls' vernacular image making doesn't diminish the archival validity of their images. The digital self is not necessarily an unreal or inauthentic self, but instead it's a presentation of a particular reality toward a certain goal. As an inherently selective process, self-curation requires fragmentation, meaning no one's digital self-presentation offers a full characterization or representation of their subjectivity. And I should note that our in-person presentations also don't necessarily reflect a full characterization of our subjectivities. However, those fragments are real parts of the subjective whole and the realness of these fragments still holds true even when self-curation is performative, because that performance is still part of one's subjective composition. 
and the digital self archive broadly defined. Now, when I'm talking about self curation, I do want to clarify that I, I'm not suggesting that Black girls have unlimited authority over their images in digital spaces. Despite the supposed protections offered by privacy settings on social media, none of us has complete control over who sees and shares the images that we post on the internet. However, Black girls self curation does give them the ability to present the parts of themselves that they choose to present. Exhibiting this agency within and against disempowering social contexts speaks to one of many ways Black girls enact Black girl autopoetics through their social media content. And so I'll close by reading part of um, the conclusion of chapter two. Memory, both individual and collective, is a central component of Black American life. Related to the preservation of memory are the complementary processes of storytelling and archiving. While both oral and literary traditions compose a critical part of the Black American storytelling tradition, visuality also plays a key role in narrativizing Black life and preserving collective Black memory. The invention of photography marked a significant time in the evolution of the documentation and archiving of Black life. And the mass production of cameras allowed everyday Black Americans to document their experiences through photography. The camcorder enhanced memory building even more through the ability to record things in real time. Both of these technologies have facilitated preservation of Black memory in a way that simply was not possible before their invention. And the photographic and videographic capabilities of cell phones have enhanced the image-based preservation of Black life and Black stories even more. While Black girls' digital documentation practices correspond to a history of Black vernacular photography, they also show us the importance of building and maintaining archives of the moment. As Jennifer Morgan writes, quote, the archive suggests itself as the place that houses the past, but in fact, its meaning is primarily that of the future, end quote. Black girls archival work, whether intentional or not, makes evidence this relationship between the archive and time. Therefore, Black girls' creation of informal archives through their social media content attests to Black girl autopoetics as a spatio-temporal formation. Black girls' digital documentation practices allow for archival worlding, giving us both clues about the past and keys to the future. Social media platforms as corporate entities have significant limitations regarding their durability as archives of Black memory because profit drives their functionalities and availability. While we should not place the responsibility of collecting Black memory exclusively in the hands of corporate actors, social media applications do offer a readily accessible tool for Black girls to document their lives in this moment. Vernacular image making and exhibition within these spaces offer important departure points for rethinking the relationship between Black memory, Black life, and Black survival. The way Black girls record their lives demonstrates how the preservation of memory is not a task solely for academics or trained professionals. Because Black girls' cultural work as informal digital archivists illustrates their desires to show their lives while simultaneously highlighting the precarity of where their archives exist currently, Black girls need all of us to be keepers of Black memory. Black girls show us that documenting the everyday will be a key part of preserving Black memory and therefore Black life. Thank you. Thank you so much for that great presentation, Professor Wade. Um, now we're going to open the floor to some questions. 
Um, I have a couple of questions that have been sent previously. Um, one question that we have for you is, how does the implementation of AI impact the representation on Black people on social media? Um, so thank you for that question. I think that AI changes a lot of things um, when we're thinking about cultural production in general, but also when we're thinking about Black cultural production specifically. So um, I do think that there, I do think that there's a way that AI changes like the kinds of Black cultural production that we see in online spaces. And also I think that it also changes like who is producing certain things and calling it Black cultural production. So it, it does, I think, have a significant impact on how we understand um, Black representation. And I think that's something that we are going to have to continue to grapple with in terms of thinking about the, I guess, like the, the gravity of that impact on Black representation and cultural production. Next question is, what movie resonates with you the most? What movie resonates with me the most? Oh, that's a really hard question. As a, someone <laughs> who has watched a lot, of um, hmm. I'm trying to think. So, people who, if I, if any of my students are here, um, <laughs> you're probably going to like laugh about me saying this because we're going to watch this movie in class next week, but. I really love the movie Miss Juneteenth. Um, I like the way that it portrays Black girlhood as complex, but also like has uh, mixtures of, it just, I think it's just very accurate portrayal of some of the things that Black teen girls experience. And it does it in a way that doesn't adultify the main character but also takes her seriously um, and takes her needs and um, her desires seriously. So that is a movie that I think deeply resonates with me, especially in terms of how it portrays Black girlhood. Yeah, I'm gonna have to add it to my list of movies to watch. Um, yeah. I'm old school, I go with The Color Purple. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> And actually, you know, the, the remake, I saw the remake um, recently, and I really enjoyed that too. I felt like, um, I felt like it did the, I felt like it did the Black feminist message of the original text, Justice. Um, and so, yeah, that's something that resonates with me too, the original and the remake. Very good question. Um, can you speak on the experiences of Black girls who are high achieving? Hmm. Um, hmm. I wish I could ask like a little bit of a follow-up, but I'll try to answer that um, to the best of my ability. So um, I think that one thing that high achieving Black girls experience is this um, kind of liminal space where they're both um, rewarded for being high achieving, but then also punished is not the right word, but met with higher expectations of the things that they should handle or the things that they can take on that they might not, that is probably they shouldn't be taking on because they are still girls. Um, and so I think that that experience, um, it just makes it, it makes it difficult to be high achieving because you, you want to do it, you know, for yourself or sometimes, you know, for other people, um, you know, but when we're, if we're being realistic, you know, if we're thinking about like black girls who are trying to get into specific colleges or black girls who are trying to get, you know, scholarships to play specific sports or, you know, things like that, you are achieving for yourself, but also achieving to appeal to these like external um, actors as well. Um, and so I do think that like high achievement puts black girls in a, 
an a complex position, right? Because it's you don't want to not achieve or, you know, be mediocre, but at the same time, you know, if you do achieve, then the expectations tend to be like so much greater than the expectation of your peers of other races who are at the same level as you, but for some for some reason, like you're expected to do more and to be more. Yeah. Um, another question that we also have now the reverse, can you speak on the experiences of introverted black girls? But then they ask, how did that personality type impact their familial and social relationships? Hmm. So um, that's an interesting question yeah, because pretty good question I too. am an introvert um, and I can speak to how uh, <laughs> how that introversion did impact my, um, you know, relationships, you know, with family um, and peers, you know, in school. Um, I think that introversion, especially for Black girls, oftentimes is misunderstood as being standoffish or having an attitude or not wanting to be bothered with people. Um, and so that kind of um, interpretation of introversion can be very difficult for Black girls to navigate with family members, but also with peers, um, because it's not really, it's, there's such a dissonance between how people read you and how you actually think of and understand yourself. Um, and I think that the, one of the biggest things for me as an introverted Black girl was having friends who understood me and accepted me. Um, and I think that that is um, really important for um, all Black girls, but I think introverted Black girls, you, you definitely need like your squad who understands you um, and doesn't try to like push you to be um, something or someone that you're not. How does your work on Black girlhood contribute to a long history of Black girls from the 18th and 19th century? Hmm. I feel like this person who the person who asked this question must like know my work a little bit. So <laughs> um so um even though I study like black girls primarily like in contemporary context, so like on social media um and on the internet, I do have an article that talks about black girls from um, like the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Um, and thinking about how the way that Black girls create social media content now is similar to how Black girls were using the media outlets available to them during those time periods to express themselves and to tell their stories. So the two publications that I talk about um, in that um, in that piece are the woman's or a woman's era. Um, which was um, started by um, Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin in 1896, I think. Um, any historians, y'all can correct me if that's not the right date. But um, but it was, you know, the late 1800s. Um, and there are a few issues of that, um, that newspaper that have a section called Chats with Girls. And there's one chat where a young girl writes in and she asks for recommendations for books to read for like younger girls, because she said that, that all the literature that they had recommended previously were for was for like girls that were older than her. Um, so that's an, a very early example of like a black girl using this like media outlet to express herself. Um, the other publication that I talk about it's the Brownies book, um, which was a literary magazine for Black children um, founded by W.E.B. Du Bois and edited by Jesse Redmond Fawcett. And um, in that, that series, if you ever get a chance to look at those, they only had 24 issues. So it was published in 1920 and 1921. But if you ever get a chance to read that like black girls were some of the main contributors of content for 
those magazines. So they were writing short stories, they were writing poetry, they were submitting letters about, you know, their lives. Um, they were submitting pictures from um, pageants and like things that they were participating in. Um, so like that was, um, that was a really like early media space for black girls. And so like the way that black girls are using social media is very similar to how black girls then were using the media sources that were available to them. That was a pretty deep question. <laughs> I'm glad you answered it pretty well. Um, and uh, there's, these two questions are pretty similar, so I'm just going to combine them too. But um, we all want to know, I'm curious too, who got you into this field? Um, can you share some details about uh, that as well? Um, and the audience is also interested in your personal work and also about like the genre, specific photographic mediums, et cetera. Okay. Um, so in terms of, you know, what got me into media studies um, and African-American studies um, also, um, I think that, you know, I've always been very interested in media and fascinated by media. So like, I remember getting my first like copy of Seventeen magazine when I was like nine. <laughs> so like ever since then, like I've always been obsessed with like, um, like magazines. I've, I've, I used to love magazines. I used to love to watch music videos. And like uh, when um, AOL chat first came out and ICQ, I was always on there. Even though I wasn't supposed to be, I was supposed to be in bed, but I used to be up all night, you know, on ICQ and AOL. Um, and so as a, as a child, I didn't, know that I could actually like turn my love for media into a career um, into an area of study um, but during my undergraduate studies um, I was guided by professors to really like you know do in-depth analysis of the media that I was consuming and that really stuck with me um, and then the other, other than just being inclined to enjoy popular media, I also um, was a high school teacher, like I mentioned in my, at the beginning of my presentation. And so like that experience had a huge impact on me studying Black girls in media spaces specifically, because I just really wanted to know, like, because a lot of the Black girls that I at the schools that, where I worked, didn't feel like they belonged in those schools. I wanted to know, like, where are places that Black girls feel like they belong? And do they feel like they have digital spaces where they can be free and express themselves? So I would say that those two things had the most significant impact on um, my entry into media studies and Black studies. Um, I kind of would like to ask uh, also, um, did you have a mentor to help guide you into this? This is my own personal question to you. I'm sure the audience might want to know as well. Yeah, so I mean, I've had several mentors um, throughout my um, academic career, uh, but I can say that um, I probably first got the idea to even pursue a PhD. Um, well, not probably, I got the idea to first uh, pursue a PhD um, during undergrad, I went to North Carolina a and for undergrad, and I was in a major that I didn't like. I picked it because I got tired of people asking me what I was going to do with my major. And so I'm like, oh, well, if I'm a business major, then it'll be obvious what I'm going to do. Um, and But I was taking this English class. It was, you know, uh, an upper level English class. And I was a, a freshman or first year, as we say at UVA. And... Um, I wrote this paper and my professor didn't give it back to me when she was like passing out the papers. And she was like, oh, I wanna read your paper as an example. And I was like, oh, okay, great. <laughs> so then she like wrote a note on my second paper saying like, you should consider getting your PhD. And I was like, maybe she thinks I'm a senior because it was like an upper level class. And so I went to talk to her in office hours and I said, I'm, I'm only a freshman and she said, 
I know. She was like, and if you're already like this engaged with the theory that we're talking about in class, like you should definitely like consider going to graduate school and getting a PhD. And that was kind of the first time that I really even knew that that was a possibility for me um, and that I could make a career out of researching and reading and writing all things that I love to do. Um, so needless to say, I changed my major, <laughs> um, but I, um, yeah, I definitely had, she was one of my first mentors. And then I had several other mentors throughout um, undergrad and graduate school. Wow, what an impact. One person believing in you and look yeah. at you today. Yeah. I just wanted to let the audience know, um, just again, that your book is available uh, through the Duke University Press and uh, the code again, 30% off discount, E24AWADE, um, because, wow, I'm just so honored to have gotten a chance to meet you and have you talk to us. Um, the last question, um, and I think this applies to all of us here on the panel, is uh, what's your favorite UVA memory? My favorite UVA memory? Hmm. So this is only my second year at UVA as a faculty member. Um, but you came but back. I, <laughs> yes, that's true. Um, I think maybe one of my favorite memories um, from UVA is um, the, the presentations that happened in my Black Girlhood and the media course last spring. Um, I was just so impressed by the way that students approached the topic because they could do their presentations, their projects on anything that they wanted. Like it was wide open. And the level of like creativity that they expressed in doing those projects and the presentations, um, it was really like inspiring to me. And so I would say that that like the, those presentations um, would definitely be one, one of my favorite memories. Well, thank you again, Professor Wade. Thank um, you for having me. We are so yeah, happy. Thanks for being have. patient with my technical like faux pas at the beginning. A Zoom meeting <laughs> for, for technical difficulties. <laughs> <laughs> but um, we're going to close the talk today. I'm going to pass the, the mic to Joshua. He's going to end our, our program today. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Wade. And thank you, Michelle, for moderating. Thank you, Professor Wade, for that incredible, incredible lecture. Um, as a brother of five sisters, um, five black sisters, um, that was just incredible to learn more and to and to be a great and, and nurturing uncle to my two nieces as well. So thank you all for joining us tonight. Uh, before we bring this event to a close, we just want to share some quick resources. Um, should you want to learn more about the UVA Club's global network. And please stay tuned for our next speaker in this series, Richard Lindgren, happening on March 28th. And we'll talk about the physics of sports. Um, but then again, please click, uh, bring out your phone and hit those QR codes to learn more about the UVA Clubs and events that are in your area. Thank you all. Have a great night.